Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dye, and in this video, we're gonna be looking at what happens when we don't have oxygen present during glucose catabolism. So in aerobic respiration, oxygen served as the final electron acceptor. This allowed ATP production using high energy electrons carried by NADH and FADH2 through the electron transport chain. However, when aerobic respiration isn't possible, um, NADH needs to be reoxidized to NAD plus for glycolysis to continue. So that's, we have alternate methods that have to come into play. <clears throat> Some living systems use organic molecules in the electron transport chain as the final electron acceptor. Um, collectively, this is known as fermentation. So in contrast, um, others utilize inorganic molecules, something other than uh, besides oxygen as the final electron acceptor to generate NAD+. Um, this latter process is called anaerobic respiration as it doesn't require oxygen. Um, both methods enable organisms to better generate energy in the absence of oxygen. Neither is gonna produce the, the kind of ATP volume that you get from oxidative phosphorylation, but that's okay. You know, as we're gonna see the kinds of organisms and the kind of scenarios where we're gonna utilize the fermentation um, is different. All right, so lactic acid fermentation. Animals and some bacteria like those in yogurt employ lactic acid fermentation. So this process is common in mammalian red blood cells and in skeletal muscles with inadequate oxygen for aerobic respiration, such as fatigued muscles. Um, <clears throat> and these muscles, the lactic acid um, produced through fermentation gets transported via the bloodstream to the liver for further processing. It's this whole process and there's this ongoing debate. Oh, is, is lactic acid what's causing your delayed onset muscle soreness, DOMS? Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, there's a lot of debate. What we do know is that that lactic acid does get used and it will be used to produce more ATP so you can keep going. Um, so the enzyme responsible for this reaction, for this lactic acid fermentation reaction, is called lactate dehydrogenase. Remember, there's that ACE again at the end. Um, while the reaction can occur in both directions, uh, acidic conditions inhibit the left to right reaction. Um, so you get this accumulation of, of lactic acid. Um, once the lactic acid is transported to the liver, it gets converted back into pyruvic acid, and now we can use it to start making more energy. So in animals, this especially makes sense, right? <clears throat> okay, you know, maybe your oxygen intake is just not efficient enough, maybe you're at high altitudes, whatever. Um, your body finds a way to utilize any of those byproducts in the most efficient way it possibly can. So if you have this lactic acid building up because you aren't able to do oxidative phosphorylation fast enough, that's okay. It goes into the bloodstream, your liver processes it, sends pyruvic acid out to the other places in your body that need it. So either way, you still get energy. All right. Here we go. Uh, so another well-known type of fermentation is called alcohol fermentation. This is gonna yield ethanol, which is an alcohol. In the initial reaction, pyruvic acid loses a carbonyl group, um, liberating a carbon dioxide molecule as gas. Uh, this becomes important later. Um, this loss of carbon dioxide reduces the molecule by one carbon atom, resulting in acetylaldehyde. In the subsequent reaction, NADH loses an electron to form NAD+, while acetylaldehyde accepts the electron producing ethanol. Uh, Yeast-mediated fermentation of pyruvic acid leads to the production of ethanol, a component of alcoholic beverages. Um, in beverages like beer and sparkling wines, the carbon dioxide is not vented from the fermentation chamber. It's kept there, and as the pressure builds, the carbon dioxide dissolves into the, uh, the liquid. Um, so then, you know, like if you've ever opened a carbonated beverage, right? It, you hear the little sound and some bubbles come up and, you know, of course, soda, which is jam packed with carbon dioxide um, to make it really fizzy, um, releases a lot, lots of big bubbles. Um, but like beer or sparkling wines, unless you shake them up, they don't usually overflow. Uh, they don't have as much carbon dioxide. There's a, a limit to how much um, the yeast can produce. Um, all right. So to avoid yeast toxicity, 
ethanol levels in wine are naturally limited to limited to a maximum of 12 percent and and that varies um, there are some specialized things where they'll really try to ramp it up um, and there's been some neat genetically modified yeast that can handle um, higher ethanol percent and stay alive ninja yeast and stuff like that and they're they're kind of novelties um, that you can you can look up if you're interested in how that works um, but most yeast has has a limit for how much ethanol it can survive in. Um, I mean, if your yeast all die before you finish out your reactions, then whatever your product you're trying to produce isn't gonna isn't gonna be what you expected. All right. So last, we're gonna look at anaerobic cellular respiration. So certain prokaryotes, including bacteria and archaea species engage in anaerobic respiration. So for example, a group of archaea known as methanogens, um, they reduce carbon dioxide to produce methane while oxidizing NADH. Um, these microorganisms are found in soil and digestive tracts of ruminants like cows and sheep. Um, that's like the, the joke, right, about cows. Like they are the major methane producers on the planet. Quite, quite literally because they have bacteria living in their guts that are producing methane through anaerobic cellular respiration. Um, similarly, there are sulfate reducing bacteria and archaea. Uh, they are primarily anaerobic and they reduce sulfate to hydrogen sulfate to regenerate NADH and NADH plus, or for, to regenerate NAD plus from NADH, excuse me. Um, so like, uh, sulfur like sulfur pits and stuff like we find we find these organisms in them like if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park they have some really interesting um, water sources that have just crazy high temperatures or really high sulfur levels and that's where we find some of these organisms um, other bacterial fermentation processes exist as well um, many prokaryotes are what we call facultative anaerobes meaning that they can switch back and forth between aerobic respiration and fermentation depending um, depending on the oxygen availability, which, you know, that makes sense evolutionarily, that you would have processes that give you the most advantage to survive in whatever environment you find yourself in. Um, on the other hand, some prokaryotes like um, Clostridia bacteria, they're what we call obligate anaerobes, and they cannot survive in the presence of oxygen. Uh, it's actually toxic to them, so they have to be in an anaerobic environment. Um, it's worth noting that all forms of fermentation, except uh, lactic acid fermentation, result in gas production. Um, so types of gas produced serve as an indicator um, of carbohydrate fermentation, um, like in the lab, so aiding in like, bacterial identification. So, okay, you know, we what, what organism is this? We actually have media that, depending on what they produce, it can change color. It's just neat stuff like that. Um, so all these different like, diverse ways of doing fermentation um, are to ensure an adequate supply of NAD plus for that sixth step in glycolysis, a way to keep driving it forward so we can keep producing ATP. Um, without these, that step would be inhibited and no ATP could be harvested from glucose breakdown. We have to be able to harvest glucose, right? We, we need or harvest the ATP from glucose. Otherwise, you have no energy to spend in the cell. All right. So thank you for joining me for our discussion on fermentation and I will see you in our next video.